The last video for Chinese film classics took us halfway through Ma Xu Wei Bang's 1937 horror musical film Song at Midnight, Ye Ban Ge Sheng, up to the moment when it is about to reveal the hideous transformation of the scarred revolutionary Song Danping. In this video, we'll pick up from that melodramatic moment when we are first faced, literally and viscerally, with the horror of historical violence. We'll also do a close reading of the second half of the film, which contains not one, but several sensational revelations, and discuss some of the film's political messaging. So Song Danping has just survived an acid attack, and is recuperating in the home of his theatrical troop leader, Mr. Zhong. His entire head and his hands are swathed in bandages, and he pleads with Zhong to take them off so that he can see the flowers and read the letter that his lover, Xia, has sent him. She'll be coming to visit him tomorrow. As Mr. Zhong unwinds the bandages from Danping's head, the camera shows the Zhongs and old Zhang, the caretaker of the theater, looking on, and we hear Danping's voice urging him on impatiently. The storm raging outside climaxes as the final bandage comes off. But the little girl screams and all four of the spectators retreat in horror. The suspense is drawn out. We see only reaction shots and the back of Dan Ping as he stumbles forward to a mirror. Then a dissolve gradually reveals his scarred face and he picks up a candle to gaze upon his own hideous visage. The mirror represents another doubling. It is as a reflection that the man is first seen as distorted apparition, a self that's as virtual as the smooth visage we have just seen in Song Danping's photograph from 1913. Danping knocks down the candle, smashes the mirror, and rages around the room as the camera intercuts the horrified reactions of old Zhang and Mr. Zhong. Xia's reaction to the news of Danping's supposed death reenacts Danping's shock and hysteria. At her house, Xia suffers a nervous breakdown, and her insanity is conveyed through a rapid montage of canted framings, giddy superimposed images, and blurred focus, which combine with a thundering crash of piano wires as like a dramatic sound effect. She finally collapses and spits blood. We then see old Zhang, the theater caretaker, breaking the news of Xia's collapse to Dan Ping, who remains off screen. These extended flashbacks show how the Phantom came to be, and Dan Ping concludes his story to the young actor Sun Xiao O, oh, and then points out the window to the balcony and window opposite, where for 10 years, Xia has come out at midnight to hear him sing to comfort her. Dan Ping, however, refuses Xiao O's oh's suggestion that he just go have someone tell Xia that he has not died, because he fears her reaction at seeing his true visage. With another sonic crash, Dan Ping tears his head covering off, and again we have this unveiling of the hideous scar. He implores Xiao O oh to use his voice to comfort Xia in his stead. The camera then cuts to Xia's residence, where the long-haired, pale-faced woman in a ghostly white robe is drawn to the window and looks out to see Xiao O oh standing in the woods as Dan Ping's doppelganger where he reenacts the scene of their rendezvous from a decade earlier. Xiao O oh speaks on Dan Ping's behalf as the disfigured man looks on from a hiding place in the woods. Xiao O oh advises Xia not to be scared. He urges her to believe that Dan Ping will always be by her side until the dawn finally arrives. But unlike, say, Cyrano de Bergerac, Xiao O oh is not courting this woman on another's behalf. He's entreating her to live with optimism. Alone in the cobwebbed, misty woods, she repeats the words dawn, guangming. Still in the garden the next morning, she seems to have finally awakened from her reverie. The film as a whole focuses on marginalized figures, including these nocturnal ghostly phantoms, but also artists on the stage. The angel troupe, for example, can only afford to inhabit a physical space that is on the brink of death. Right, The theater is condemned to be demolished. And this old theater from the beginning then is only really a temporary refuge from the storm or perhaps political storm. But even their respite is cut short because their box office receipts decline and they face eviction. This plot point is somewhat self-referential as many of the film's actors came from the theater world and were very familiar with the profession's economic precariousness. At this point in the story, the Phantom comes to the rescue. 
He has not been idle this past decade. He has written new operatic works, and he has even revised his old hit, Hot-Blooded, Ruxue, which he predicts with a maniacal laugh and a sweep of his cape will be a sensation for the angel troupe. The plight of performers in a traveling theater troupe is an enduring theme in modern China, as seen in films like Xie Jin's 1965 Stage Sisters, Wu Tai Jie Mei, or more recently in Chen Kai Ge's Farewell My Concubine. Star stage performers were popular and attractive, but they could also be prey to the moneyed, entitled patrons who might seek to exploit them. And Song at Midnight dramatizes this physical threat via the character Tang Jun, who now owns the theater and has set his sights on Xiao O's beloved, the female lead, Lu Die. History, it seems, looks set to repeat itself. Song Danping, meanwhile, is distraught to have discovered that Xiao O already has a lover and is thus unavailable to pair with Xia. Xiao O seeks him out in his tower, but the depressed Danping bids him a gruff, despairing farewell. Lu Die's rebuff of Tang Jun and Xiao O's misunderstanding of their relationship is dealt with quickly and even perfunctorily as the plot accelerates towards a conclusion. Tang attacks Lu in her dressing room, just as Xiao O, as the tortured hero, is performing the climax of Hot Blooded on stage. Xiao O comes backstage just in time for Tang to shoot and kill Lu in his arms. At that moment, the phantom Song Danping reappears to confront Tang, and during the extended fight scene that follows, the tension literally escalates with the pair grappling all the way up to Danping's tower room. Meanwhile, the play has stopped and the audience members chase the fighting pair up to the locked tower room. Following Tang's death, Danping escapes by swinging down to the stage on a rope. And at this moment, the long-hidden phantom literally takes center stage with a melodramatic entrance. But the exposure precipitates his demise. Xiao O takes the stage and yells at the crowd, he's a man, not a ghost, but his calls go unheeded. The final chase sequence, which uses extensive canted framing, superimposition, and match-on action editing, is one of the most melodramatic in early Chinese cinema. A torch-wielding mob chases the phantom from the theater, through the streets, and to an abandoned tower which it sets alight. Cascading orchestral music and intercut shots of crashing waves heighten the tension. Two intercut sequences show Xia relapsing into madness. Then just as the burning phantom plunges from the fiery tower inferno set by the mob into the river, Xia suddenly awakens from her dream. The mob, it seems, has purged the ghastly apparition from its mist in a ghostly exorcism. The melodramatic death of the scarred revolutionary also exorcises Xia's trauma and allows her to regain her sanity and her memory. The climax and denouement bring together spectacle, romance, doubling, symmetry, and light triumphing over dark. In the last shot of the film, Xiao O and Xia, at the edge of a cliff, stand together staring off into the dawn. Xiao O had once asked Lu Die what she would do if she and he were forced to part, and she replied that she would commit suicide. In the end, Lu Die dies protecting her man, who steps in as the protector of a dead man's woman. A young angel, Xiao O, takes the place of an older martyr who has been forced to live a hellish existence. The earlier play within a play was called The Romance of the Yellow River, and Song Danping's last gesture of self-sacrifice may well have been to throw himself into the Yellow River, that sublime symbol of an eternal China. Shortly after Song at Midnight was made in 1937, China plunged into war with Japan. The film's mood of trepidation, horror, and menace, combined with this ambiguous political message, could be interpreted as expressing the sense of dread of a country on the verge of war. In Song at Midnight, the play within a play, Romance of the Yellow River, is set during the Song Dynasty. This is the same song as in Song Danping, but not the same song as in Song at Midnight. Um, that's a confusion that would only arise in English. Its theme of separated lovers is then dramatized in the story of Song Danping and his waiting woman. Song at Midnight itself thus invites reading as something of a political allegory. As film scholar Yomi Bracer points out, the film makes an implicit appeal to the audience to acknowledge the suffering of underground revolutionaries of yesteryear. 
The film also anticipates the logic of inevitable revolutionary succession, known in Chinese as Ziyou Holai Ren, which is made explicit in many communist era films. Braister points out that the off screen phantom teaches the young actor not only how to sing the revolutionary songs of old, but also how to fulfill the destiny that the phantom himself was unable to realize. Revolution here is literally taking place on stage and backstage. The triumphant restaging of Hot Blooded as, quote, Song Dan Ping seemingly come back to life, as the handbill states, presents revolutionary inheritance as self consciously theatrical. Yet political theater, at least in this scene, has its limits. The power of repetition, it seems, overwhelms the promise of forward progress. And the audience is agitated only to bay for the hot blood of the maimed revolutionary, not of the assailants who made him so ghoulish. So it seems that at the crucial moment, when the stage play is collapsing and the real drama is afoot, Sun Xiaoh's voice fails. It fails to overcome the audience's revulsion at the sight of monstrosity. In this 1937 film, a devilish apparition, viewed by the unsympathetic mob as a gui, is killed off, but an enlightened representative of the next generation vows that that revolutionary spirit will live on. After China declared war against Japan, the invaders were referred to as gui, or devils, an epithet that excoriated their inhumanity. Song at Midnight's ideology, though vague, seems to indicate that eliminating evil and eliminating scapegoats alike can be done, but that it can be done at great cost.